Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. Thank you again for joining us here, um, having conversations with the authors and editors of the World Happiness Report 2022. Today, we have the privilege of having Professor Chris Barrington Lee talk about his chapter, chapter three, on um, trends and conceptions of progress and well being. Um, so, we will be having a very nice and brief uh, presentation by Chris. And don't worry, his uh, presentation will be available by PDF after uh, the webinar. And uh, we would love for you to add, ask questions during the presentation. So at the end, we can definitely do a live uh, uh, Q&A with Chris. And I hope you'll be able to enjoy it. So please do submit your questions in the chat box or the question box. So uh, Chris, please. Thank you very much, Sharon. Yes, the title of, of, uh, of the chapter three is Trends in Conceptions of Progress and Wellbeing. Given that over 9 million people read the World Happiness Report last year, you might wonder how the report itself is influencing ideas and attention related to happiness around the world? Uh, that's not a question that I'm going to be able to answer directly. But the, the content of the, of the report is usually focused on the measurement of happiness, reporting of happiness, and understanding of happiness. But there's a deeper overarching message behind the rankings and the science. And that is this message. And this is to quote from chapter one uh, this year, the true, the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the message behind the work is that the true, not one, the true measure of progress is the happiness of the people, that happiness can be measured, that we know a lot about what causes it, and that given this knowledge, it's now possible for policymakers to make people's happiness the goal of their policy. I would say this is a profound and transformative agenda and you know the, the full implications of it, I can so far only imagine. So how do you get to a world in which society's expectations for progress and policy are more human-centered? I don't have a specific theory of change in mind, but I would say that along that path, the choice of what actually gets measured and the intellectual ideas that gain attention and the policy that actually gets made all must pull each other along, along with those public expectations. So this chapter explores in a, a modest uh, and simple ways that are available, the trends in thought and um, thought and attention about human well-being and social progress. So some would call this looking at uh, the change in narrative, which means technical science uh, and the technical advances in science that are that are going on to understand happiness, what really matters at the society level is a narrative change. So chapter three starts uh, looking at this narrative change. How is the discourse around progress and well-being changing? How do people and institutions conceive of progress? We find, first of all, interest in happiness is on the rise. And I'll show you evidence uh, from, for this from, from books, from the emphasis in academic research from the geographic spread of that research and based on the way that organizations and governments construct measures of progress. Secondly, those, those efforts to design new indicators of progress are evolving and they're increasingly evidence-based and fo focused on or incorporating um, subjective well-being. Governments are increasingly looking to the science of happiness to inform their decision making and even budget making approaches. And I'll show you they're becoming more explicit about having subjective experience in mind when they do that thinking and talking about well being. Chapter concludes with a little bit of advice. I'm not going to go into that much today, but you might say that it is a warning that if you want to make happiness a priority goal for government, that doesn't mean that policy making becomes mechanical or easy. So let me start with evidence from the text in written books. A broad measure of attention to, uh, can, can be had thanks to the magic of Google 
uh, having scanned over 40 million books, every word in the book. Um, and you can look up the history in their data of how frequently any given word or phrase was used in a given year. So for instance, this plot shows how often the word happiness uh, appears in print from 1995 to 2019. And this is as a fraction of the total number of words. So as a fraction, you can see over this time period, it's more than doubled. Since 2013 or so, happiness has occurred more frequently than the phrase gross domestic product, which might be significant as an older measure of progress. In fact, the, the, the uh, mention of GDP has been declining since 2010. Now, even more stark is what's happened to the word, the use of the word income, which uh, you can see that here, part of a multi-decade trend of decreasing use, it actually peaked around 1980, which is before this plot starts, and its use has cut in half during this period, since uh, 1995. Uh, also shown here are life satisfaction and subjective well-being. These are actually scaled up uh, for this plot, and even though they're used much less frequently than the others, their growth is actually in a relative sense, even higher. So during this period, the frequency of the use of subjective well-being has gone up by a factor of eight. There are a few other phrases or terms that uh, are less common, but also change have changed interestingly. Uh, this one here that shoots up explosively after 2012 is references to the World Happiness Report itself. 2012 was the first edition. And you can see that World Happiness Report is now actually mentioned more frequently than gross, than uh, genuine progress indicators, and indeed than, um, than the, the phrase beyond GDP, which is still in increasing. Uh, beyond GDP is a, you know, important in the, in the history of these things and, and a driving concept actually tied to the origins of the World Happiness Report. Now, there are a lot of books in English, but Google does this stuff for multiple languages. So the trends I just showed you are actually fairly consistent across different languages that, that are available uh, in, in the database from Google. And th this plot shows the relative uh, incidence again of translations of the word happiness appropriately translated into seven different languages. And essentially you can see that it's, it's going up in all of them. The possible tick here in, in Chinese, which also actually interestingly had a dip earlier, but they're essentially all trended upwards. Similarly, if we look at the, these com, you know, con contrasting words um, that I showed you in English, here are plots for six different languages of what's happened to mention of economic growth. And you can see that either since the turn of the century or since earlier, they're all trending downwards. That's also true of references to income. Another interesting lens on society is to look at academic research. And there we find similar trends for interest in happiness. So this plot uh, is a bit tricky, but this shows the fraction of publications which mention either or any of life satisfaction, subject well-being, or happiness in either their title or their abstract in uh, two research fields. This is the uh, psychology-related research journals. This is economics-related research journals. This is actually all gene all research journals. And this is again the fraction of uh, art, uh, you know, it's a fraction of articles which contain one of these three words. It's also on a factor of 10 scale. So this means that in, in these two fields, the, the frequency uh, or the, the, the fraction of articles that which are researching one of these topics has gone up by a factor of more than 10. Again, so these are large changes um, in attention and interest. Now, uh, this I found especially interesting. Here, we're looking at exclusively at research articles that are uh, in economics-related journals and which contain one of those three happiness-related terms, subjective well-being, happiness, life satisfaction. But within just those articles, we're now unpacking, separating out the three happiness-related terms. And so it turns out uh, that happiness the mention of happiness is actually on the decrease, right? So at the beginning, it was more than 80 or 90% of, of academic studies mentioned uh, this word. It's being replaced with the more specific uh, terms, life satisfaction and subjective well-being. And the other thing to note here is that amongst these happiness-related studies, the mention of policy is going up over time. 
Okay, staying with academia for one more graphic, uh, the, um, you know, the interesting questions are about the whole world. So, and again, a lot of academic work is done in English, but we want to see globally who is contributing to this, the evidence base about happiness. So I'm gonna show you a changing map over the 50 years of research so far. This is about where the academic authors are writing from. Let's focus again on economics. And we see that in the first 25 years of, of, the, of this field, there were just a few countries contributing. Actually, during this period, um, there were only 11 journal articles. So uh, it started slowly, took off just in the, in the mid 1990s. And um, the, the units here are, in are authorship per 10 million inhabitants. So this is scaled to the size of the country that where authors are coming from. Okay, so that's the first 25 years. The subsequent 10 years saw a much higher pace of publication. And now I'm showing you five-year periods for the rest, and you can see the, the field grows by orders of magnitude over this period. Um, oops, and, and it's spread globally, so that the, the science of happiness is now truly a global endeavor. Okay, uh, so now, now I want to switch gears to talk about another study we did to assess changing conceptions of progress and well being. In this case, we assembled a database of 166 indicator systems. So, what's an indicator system? It's, it's an effort from around the world where somebody has, uh, has an idea to build an index or a dashboard. Uh, you know, an indicator system of some kind of progress or well being. And the somebody is usually, uh, it can be communities, it can be governments, it can be sometimes it's academics. So uh, examples that you might have heard of include things like the Human Development Index and the Genuine Progress Index and the Happy Planet Index, the Gotham Prosperity Index, these are all indices, but they don't need to be indices, Bhutan's GNH, Gross National, National Happiness, the OECD Better Life Index, and many more, including many local and community level ones. So we were looking for attempts to capture well-being and progress in a coherent and measurable way. And of course, each of these is not just an attempt to measure, but it's to advocate for its particular way of doing so, of capturing those concepts. So the map on the left really just tells us that the, the desire for new measures of policy success and, and um, human thriving is a worldwide phenomenon. And the map on the right tells us that the subjective well-being approach holds growing sway around the world. These are the indicators in this database which have subjective well-being measures as, uh, as part of their metrics. We also look, for, look at the words that are used in the titles or the names of each indicator system. And we look at the words used in the rationale which the creators use to explain the purpose um, of the of the, uh, that they're intending to capture in the indicator system. And we find there that the, the fastest rise are for words, well-being and quality of life and progress among, amongst the ones that we look for. So again, that captures some of the um, language and trends that in, in people's conceptions. So last thing is that I want to talk about governments and policy. And increasingly, many of those indicator systems are actually being designed by governments themselves. And of course, it's, it's in, in government where the, the measurement and evidence can turn into uh, at least the public form of policy. So for looking at governments, this is where it gets harder to do quantitative analysis. So let me just mention some anecdotal examples of the kind of language that's being used. Uh, this is from New Zealand. New Zealand has just issued its fourth well-being budget. And in 2021, for the first time, the budget document started out uh, on page two with a summary of the status of life satisfaction across different groups and overall in New Zealand. Uh, you can see here the prime minister uh, in front of their slogan, more than GDP, and uh, some of the details of five domains in their, in their framework. Um, Here's some of the language that came out. This is back from 2019 about what this, you know, how, how much impact this new way of thinking government may have. And New Zealand is working on language and conceptual frameworks to capture and reflect the Maori knowledge around well-being. Something similar is going on in Canada. 
where a quality of life framework puts happiness measures as the organizing center of policy outcomes. So here's one of their graphics and the, the, the happiness um, measures are in the middle with five domains of other policy amenable indicators around the outside. And to quote them, uh, self-reported life satisfaction as a measure of subjective well-being that directly is a measure, sorry, of subjective well-being that directly gauges overall experienced quality of life, providing information that cannot be gathered in any other way. So in Canada's data portal, you can see the, the happiness measures there uh, up front alongside the their five domains. The UK Treasury and Office of National Statistics have taken similar steps. Uh, so to, to, to articulate their conception of well-being and progress and policy outcomes that they can influence. And they've actually gone uh, further in, in being specific about this. I'll come to that in a moment. Here's some, um, you know, they, they also uh, mention uh, national well-being alongside personal well-being, but here's uh, how they're explicit about what they mean when they, when they use this word well-being. Well-being is about how people feel. Personal well-being is measured by the Office of National Statistics through subjective reports of satisfaction, purpose, happiness, and anxiety. So they distinguish in some places between personal well-being and national well-being, but the analysis that they're prescribing is largely about valuing these national well-being dimensions and outcomes using evidence from their effects on personal well-being, i.e. happiness. And, um, and as I said, they've gone further probably than anybody else in bringing the kind of evidence that's in the World Happiness Report, meaning that explains differences in happiness, um, bringing that evidence to the more formal cost-benefit calculations that governments can do to inform their policymaking. For a last example, these are the Nordic countries, which have typically been at the top of the, the tables you're used to in, the, in chapter two of the World Happiness Report. Uh, and they are formulating language to build organizing conceptions around their policymaking. So those examples were not globally representative, but let me conclude by summarizing a few patterns which shed light on how thinking is evolving at the, the level of government. First of all, it's still the case that well-being can mean anything. So you can talk about a well-being budget or a well-being eco economy uh, without committing to anything new, um, you know, without, if you don't carefully define what those terms mean. So, um, you know, talking about well-being is, seems to be a non-threatening way to brand any policy, but at the same time, it seems to be a bit of a gateway to the happiness approach. And um, so that's, that's something which uh, came out from looking at, the, at these different efforts and, and um, was a new insight to me. So I also, I, I mentioned at the outset that measurement and knowledge and public expectation and policy must all shuffle along together. And what I see in these examples is the result of those happening and coming into alignment. And in part, I think we can say due to the, the years, the 10 years of the World Happiness Report laying the foundation for the first parts of those. Changing how we value things and how decisions are made is a risky proposition for existing institutions. And it's not gonna happen fast, but the evidence in this chapter about popular language and awareness about uh, research interests, about new frameworks for conceiving progress and about what governments are doing. These all are point, uh, point uh, to a trend in how the world conceives of the human part of our aspirations. And it's a shift towards privileging evidence on how life actually feels to us and on evidence about what makes life good and how to make it better. So let me stop there, and I'm very glad for discussion and questions on, on that. Uh, Sharon, you may still be muted. Thank you very much, Chris. That is a very good, I would say, clear summary of your 
chapter. And we appreciate that. There is a lot of data. I know some people were asking about um, where can I find this data? If you go to uh, World Happiness Report, um, the data can be found in, there's a button called data and appendices, but even throughout the, the website, you can click on a few references. Um, so the data is readily available. Um, we're gonna go. Actually, sh sh on the subject of data, can I just mention that um, some of, I, I mentioned the Google um, Books data. I should have actually have called it Google Ngrams if you want to find it. Uh, that's something that's readily available and you can go and play with and, and look at uh, exactly as I have done quite easily. I didn't mention Google Trends, which is another similar kind of database, which looks at how uh, it's not from a corpus of scanned anything. It's about how people search. And I didn't present any of that, but uh, if you do, you'll, I, you'll, you'll, you'll find similar kinds of patterns. Thank you, Chris. I was about to mention Ngrams as well, so you definitely answered the question. Um, I'm going to actually start with a question um, I had for you. Um, so I'm Sharon. I'm one of the managers of the World Happiness Report, and we were so very happy that Chris uh, was a contributing author this year. But Chris, I guess my question to you is, were you approaching this more on or did you ask yourself, you know, are people talking more about happiness or well-being, or did you do the other way around? You know, are policies talking about happiness and well-being, or what was what was your approach when doing this paper? Uh, there was probably some evolution into it as these things go, and. Um... The, the attempt has been to look at it from all sides, uh, because as I said, there's, there are these two-way or, or coupled relationships, again, and not being an expert at all on, on theory of change. Um, one thing that I'm quite sure of is that what gets measured is what people think are, is important. But what people think is, think is important is not identical to, but strongly influenced by what gets measured. And so, um, you know, we're still in one of the important policies for, for promoting well-being and happiness continues to be to keep measuring it more because it's something we didn't used to measure. And indeed, as we discover things like, um, like our social connections and, and different kinds of trust are important, we, we're having to learn how to measure those more. So I didn't look explicitly at policies. Um, in some sense, we're one step behind that still, uh, in that governments are creating these frameworks for ad, ad, informing policy making and informing budgeting. Uh, but um, you know, but I think you know, I think in the years to come, we will see that connection become stronger. So that when something is proposed, the public is asking, you know, what is the rationale in terms of how this is going to make people's lives better. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's uh, right, and and of, of course, in your chapter title itself, it says progress. So you know, we'll wait and see how how these policies, uh, I guess, evolved or get defined. Um, there is a common question, I think, if I'm just gonna maybe put some questions together. So you did um, analyze some questions. I mean, sorry, the translations. You know, Chinese, Italian, French, but and maybe the engram can, you know, or the, the strategy or method of, of the engram is, uh, will explain this, but, you know, some languages have different uh, words for happiness or well-being and so forth. Does the engram or does Google, um, what's that method? And how did, you, were you able to do the differences or was there a difference? You know, and, and like, I guess, I can't, I, can't think of a language right now, but there are so many languages that you know have different words for happiness and well-being. Yes, uh, I mean your question, um, you know, arises commonly for people in this field because of uh, because of survey questions in which we translate something like the life satisfaction question 
or another life evaluation question into many languages. And we expect to be tapping in somehow to the same kind of uh, meaning um, and also hope that the data are comparable. And so a fair bit of work has been done on that too. Um, and of course, we're, you know, any, anybody involved in this work is doing it because they, uh, because it seems like we're tapping into the same thing when, when we aren't ask that question as it is translated around the world. So um, now the Ngram database itself is not doing any translating. So the Chinese database is uh, is a database in, in written Chinese. Um, the translating came, and I should have said, I, I showed my uh, research assistants in, on, on the, my, the first slide, uh, but I should also thank, and I, and I do in the written chapter, of course, uh, a few translators who helped with those translations. So there are only the uh, seven, I think, languages that Google has scanned books in. And so for those seven languages, I got help from people who were familiar both with a little bit with subjective well-being and were native speakers in the other language to help translate. And so some of them we debated a little bit, um, but uh, you know there was consensus uh, from at least one person, uh, usually two people uh, for, for each of those languages that we had the, the, the best word. Now, the fact that um, we got similar patterns uh, across those languages, you know, gives confidence that um, that even with the variation of meaning, of course, happiness has many meanings, even in English, as I said, you know, unless you're careful defining these things, um, they can mean different stuff. So, so the trends that we see seem to be fairly robust. Thank but you. here's where people I, can here's where people can go and play and continue to um, you know put put their own translations and variations into explore patterns. Sorry. No, of course. Yes, I support that. Um, I see that many who have joined this webinar are you know either doing a PhD or writing a paper on well-being and are asking for the data and where did you get your data? So I think uh, we will of course. Uh, answer all your questions again, you know, to, to where the data is. And um, please be reminded that we will have a copy of Chris's presentation to be shared. And obviously his uh, chapter is already available online. Um, let me ask a question that has come in. Um, maybe you can answer it or you have uh, somehow relate to it. How different are indicators for, and how are, indicators for and perceptions of what happiness means between the OECD countries and least developed countries. I think we kind of touched on that, but if you had any further. Um, uh, that's not, that's a great question. And, and maybe that's not even the only distinction to make. Um, of course, I think that uh, Sharon, help me with the chapter number. There's another chapter um, five, six in in uh, this year's report that is very relevant to that, and it was touched on in the last webinar as well. Um, so, what light can I shed on that? So, nothing in the work that I presented. Um, you know, I, I I I didn't delve into that. I mean, you saw most of what I presented was was as much about attention. Uh, as really getting into the meaning. So, you know, when we look for indicators, we are uh, the, the indicator database, we're looking for what is in our judgment, people's attempt to express a broad aspiration for society in an indicator system. Um, but we're doing that also with keywords. So we're looking for, uh, you know, we, we had methods of, of searching, but of course we're, we, we come with some, some, with some um, search terms up our sleeves, including progress and and welfare and economic growth, maybe some and happiness and specifics um, to try and find those. But um, but you know what is the underlying concept there uh, of, of of an aspirational overall um, measure? Um, we're really getting at that by seeing what people are talking about when when they're thinking about those things. And as and then as for the other the word counting exercises, it's really about how much interest is there in a in a particular term. So, an excellent question is 
um, what is the meaning of, um, I, I forget exactly the wording, but you know, what is the meaning of happiness or, or well-being? And, and honestly, I think there are two ways that we get at that, neither of which is relevant to this chapter, uh, neither of which is addressed in this chapter. One, one would be to go around and ask people. So sit down with people from different cultures and languages and backgrounds and say, and just talk about the concept and, and try and learn what the differences are. Um, and the other, you know, and then that will inform what kind of questions you want to ask on a subsequent survey. And then the other is to ask about a really overarching question, like how good is life? This is, you know, the, the, the cantral ladder question, the life today question, or life satisfaction question. Ask people to evaluate their lives and then find out what it is that seems to predict some people being giving a higher answer than others. And that's exactly the kind of science that's done in the World Happiness Report. And again, as I just mentioned, the amazing lesson from the decades of work is that it seems the same kinds of things are driving people around the world to feel good about their lives. So maybe more than you might think, um, given the given the diversity we have in in cultural norms and um, and uh, you know in languages, it seems like we're all these same social beings who uh, want to have have good engagement and with others and a chance to contribute and be appreciated and loved and all those things. Thank you for mentioning that. There are some people who asked, um, you know, especially specific to the World Happiness Report, you know, we do, the, the Gallup World Poll is talking about through the Kentrell Ladder. And uh, I think we have a very nice introduction about the Kentrell Ladder in the Q&A in the World Happiness Report, because I, I noticed that some people have been asking that question. Um, the next question is from Anastasia Stasenko. Hopefully I didn't brutalize your name as much. Uh, she says, hi, Christopher. I was wondering if you had any examples of institutions, governments, or indicators that measure transformation as a distinct unit of change, as in measuring the evolution or amount slash rate of change in mindsets and policies. I know you said you didn't touch upon that in your chapter. Well, this is a, um, a very intellectual question and it's a great idea. Uh, I, and the simple answer is I don't know of any, but you should pursue this. <laughs> I wonder if this is a, you know, a good topic to apply that kind of thing to, um, in a sense, do a better job of quantifying uh, the changes than I've been able to do. Um, you know, and I mean, you could, yeah, you could ask, uh, I've given a, a qualitative sense of the direction things are moving. And in some sense that, you know, some of these changes look rapid. I mean, when something goes up by a factor of 10, that's fast by any measure. Um, so then you can think what more would you get out of knowing, um, Having, having another metric of how things were fast, things were changing. Honestly, actually, it might be difficult to come up with something that's comparable to other, other transformations. Um, but if you could, it would be interesting. Uh, you know, also just speaking um, quite speculatively, as I mentioned, for me, thinking about moving policy towards a well-being approach is, is really, uh, it could have enormous implications. So. The nice thing about it is that you can start with that as a as a um, gradual policy goal, and there are immediately implications. We know how, things that we can do now to make people's lives better. But what I'm not sure about is what does it look like if we really go all the way in 50 years? How different is society? How different is the way we spend our time? How different is the emphasis of where we put our resources? And in my view, it could be quite different. Uh, and so then. You know, now you're talking about real transformation of society. No, I, I agree. Um, the World Happiness Report just reached, you know, um, 10 publications, you know, a decade, and we've been, you know, or the measurement of what well, the control ladder has been going back uh, even decades before that. Um, so it is interesting to see one of our things we're wanting to concentrate on the future and, and your chapter really fit very well, you know, what's the progress? Um, even, even so in just like day to day, we talk about happiness and, and now more so, you know, even in the decade that I've been working with the World Happiness is, you know, 
we, we talk about subjective well-being and well-being, um, and you know, also to, to some degree mental health. Um, so I would like to say on behalf of the editors of the World Happiness Report, we are looking for students who want to actually study, you know, happiness science more. And so these questions that you have are definitely great and definitely should be asked and should be continued to be researched. It is a growing field. Um, so what do you think, Chris? Is there, this is, you know, for me being not an academic, but just observing, do you, are you seeing that this, you know, research and study on happiness, either that, you know, um, as it relates to policy or the quantity that is spoken about, do you see this area of study, at least for students and academia growing? You know, there's uh, something, well, I didn't include it in, in the report because it wasn't finished yet, but since um, the report came out, we've put together uh, a database of all of the university courses on happiness. Uh, now, again, this is mostly by, well, some web search and then networking. Um, so, uh, so there's plenty out there hopefully i can hope that there's there, there's some out there that i don't know of yet um but i'll be putting that database online and um you know maybe writing up what we found but there's two sides to it the number of courses has grown and you know maybe you could call it exponential uh but it's still small in by some measures so uh the, there's, there's also something else I didn't present today, but which is in the details of chapter three, uh, which is a bit of a caveat about the growth of research in one field at my own economics. The growth uh, in the, you know, the, as I showed you, the fraction of research articles that mention happiness related terms is going up, but it's not going up in the very top journals. So if you look at the top 20 economics journals or the top five, which is a, you know, they're sort of a well, well established pecking order of the top five econ journals, um, they had a flurry of activity in this field early on, and they seem to have slowed down. Moreover, while there's a quite sweeping growth of acceptance of the field in economics as compared to um, 10 or 20 years ago, it's still not, a, being taught as a dedicated uh, course in many economics departments, and B, it's not permeating the existing courses. So I, this is actually difficult for me to understand how you could, once you have seen the uh, read a World Happiness Report or two, how you could not be talking about happiness in your Econ 101 class. Uh, and so there's something else going on there. Now, economics, um, you know, like any academic field, the the dynamics of transformation are, are, are sociological and complicated. And economics sometimes gets changed from the outside. It gets pulled along. And in, in this case, I would say that, you know, you, you, you might say that governments are ahead of the academics in, uh, in this field. And so when, <laughs> when the, the, the UK Treasury is making cost benefit calculations with life satisfaction coefficients, um, and that's how decisions are being made, Certainly, by then, the economists are going to need to be uh, taking this kind of work into account when they do their own welfare calculations in in their papers. Anyway, that's you know, I, it sounds like a little bit of a, a complaint, but it's more of somewhere some, something I don't yet understand is why that is that piece of the transformation is slow. Um, now that said, for students who want to go into this field, it's not like it was. 20 or 10 years ago, if you want to study this, you can, and you can find someone. And if you need to reach out even beyond your boundaries of university to do it, um, do, because, um, you know, when I teach this stuff, there, there's enormous interest and, uh, and, it, it, and it really inspires people. Uh, it, it provides, you know, it provides not only a new analytic tools, but it provides a more positive picture of, uh, of our future as, as a society or societies, um, and also of a way to contribute to make things better. So um, we, we need to be teaching it more. I completely, uh, completely agree with you, Chris. Um, interestingly enough, and you know, this is actually positive, 
in that a lot of the um, requests that we get um, are to translate um, certain, you know, certain chapters or, or certain uh, re year reports on world, you know, on happiness um, and so forth. And interestingly enough, and, you know, I really do encourage students to continue to, to research and um, make make known your interest in you know happiness science and you know well-being and economics is because the majority of requests that we get in terms of having a translation of the world happiness report are from primary school so it's interesting to know that even you know in some different countries you know they're talking about happiness and well-being in primary school i don't know how that will ever translate to high school or university but um it is part of the dialogue. And that is actually one of the goals of the WHR is for students like everyone here, young and old, you know, to really research and ask the questions about, you know, well being. So I just wanted to put that aside because, you know, over the decade, we've, we have seen changes. Um, so, you know, a little bit of positive light in today's world. But there is a question about, and I know we've touched on this um, before, Chris, I think just in conversations that we've had with the editors. And so Tara Day asks, um, are you aware of, of anywhere in the world that's trying to put together subjective well-being and life satisfaction with climate transition? Um, and I guess, I'm gonna say like, even with policy, do you see where people are maybe uh, making relations to it or talking about well-being and, you know, the climate? Do you, what would you think, or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, thanks, I, Zoom actually uh, bailed on me there and I only caught the end of that question, but um, I think I have two answers to, to how happiness and, and the climate crisis relate. Um, so one is that, and I alluded to this and didn't meant to cover it further in my talk, but the last sections of the chapter deal with a tendency of uh, people who are creating the kind of indicators that I mentioned in that database, or of um, conceiving of or defining uh their own meanings for words like happiness and well-being and so on so that's that's the you know the subject of the chapter was to look at how people conceive of these things and there's a tendency when people are articulating what they mean by it or or making that concrete by putting together a set of indicators to include some things that i think uh dilute the valuable meaning and so one of those is um is to put in things like measures of sustainability. So for instance, to construct a happiness index that includes uh, greenhouse gas emissions or something like that. And I just point out that there's a conception, there's some conceptual problems with that. Um, and I understand, and, and actually al along with that, there's the same kind of um, tendency to put in measures of inequality. So. Um, you know, to use a very narrow and, and sort of old fashioned measure of inequality to, you know, put in a Gini coefficient and, and, and my, um, you know, you know and, and measures of long term sustainability into the same package and call the thing happiness. Well, you can see now that if I do that, it's really just a policy platform and I'm giving it a branding name of happiness because those things are not really related to the concept of happiness, even though happiness may be affected by um, our beliefs about what climate is going to do, there's rampant climate anxiety, and they are affected by the level of inequality of various kinds. I wouldn't use Gini, but you know the social fabric in our own society. Um, but if we want to think about happiness itself, we should actually just stick to looking at the distribution of happiness. So that's the beauty of the measure of, of, of a measure of subjective well-being, again, evaluative ones like the control ladder or life satisfaction, look at the whole distribution. We don't need to talk about inequality uh, as part of our definition of, of life evaluation if we can actually see the distribution. Oh, look, there are some people who are not very happy and there are some people who are 
who are happier, and I immediately then want to understand why and go and find out you know what's driving driving it. So the way I get out of this um, this conundrum, if you like, because I understand the motivation to try and put things in that I know where I'm finding out, oh, happiness, we can measure it. That's the most important thing for policy, almost. I want to put everything I think is important in there. The way out of that trap is to realize that happiness is not going to answer all of your policy questions. So, and I've written quite extensively on this um, and just briefly in this chapter, but you know, the point is that there's a problem if we try and make really long run societal decisions based on trying to optimize well-being in some way. And, and the basic problem is that it's too hard, is that it's too uncertain. If we're trying to make decisions based on how happy we're going to be if we mitigate 3% more and adapt 3% less to climate change in 100 years, it's nonsense. We don't have the knowledge to make a cost-benefit decision in that basis. And so we have to use a different policy-making principle to make those kind of decisions. And so part of my answer to this, this excellent question is um, that it's important to keep a distinction. We actually will not do justice to the conservation um, imperatives and the sustainability imperatives if we try and, and uh, deal with them through a happiness language. We need to have, and, and so I, I've used the word conservation. You could talk about the precautionary principle. There's gotta be some other principle that tells us, oh, these things are too dangerous. We're going to try and maintain some systems in a, in a slower changing or um, steady state because we don't want to deal with the consequences, not because we're optimizing. And in fact, if you look, not to belabor this topic too much, but if you look at how the kind of decisions we're making around climate, you know, a, a go-to nowadays is, is uh, carbon neutrality. That's not optimizing anything. That's not uh, trying to maximize happiness based on the cost of mitigation versus the benefits. That's just a conceptual focal point. It's just a natural, obvious thing to do when you know that messing with the climate uh, is, is, called, is a very risky thing. And so I'm just demonstrating that we have in fact used a different principle for making that kind of decision. Okay, I have to mention one other thing though related to climate and, um, and happiness. And this has come to me so deeply from my teaching. Um, you know, when, where I deal with young people and I actually teach classes in environmental economics at, um, at McGill, and it can be overwhelming if to tell young people here are these problems which are in some sense we know they're intractable we certainly know that they're too difficult so that i am not going to tell you the problems on on in, in one day of class and hand you the solutions here are the buttons you need to push here's how you need to spend your life pulling these levers as hard as you can and they'll solve them instead we're giving problems and saying mm, these are sticky problems and we're, you know we don't have an easy way to solve them that's really demoralizing and what I realized is that quite fortuitously, um, knowing something about the science of well-being actually gives me a way to quite credibly and honestly tell a positive vision of the future that many young people are not getting. In fact, society at large doesn't get positive visions of the future. We get apocalyptic Hollywood movies. Um, and that positive vision of the future comes from the fortuitous fact that most of the drivers, I think this was actually mentioned in your last webinar, most of the the uh, really strong explanatory factors for what what is making people happy and explaining differences in, in happiness um, are not material. They are things that we can actually invest in and build up the um, better environments for people to thrive in, a, in terms of their social interactions and their identity and their fulfillment and all the things that seem to actually drive our, happy, our, our satisfaction. Uh, we can invest in those without um, you know, without big material impacts. And so the happy version of the future is not that doing one, doing that, investing in, in say happiness policy is going to solve our sustainability problems, nor is the converse the, the case, but there are credible, feasible paths forwards in which we impose material constraints on society in order to meet those environmental imperatives at the same time as appropriately investing in the supports that build better lives for people um, such that life is getting better for, for everybody through the whole process. And actually many would argue that having that kind of uh, positive story is essential for people to come together to solve collective problems, to be outgoing and pro-social in there and inventive in fact, right? If we are, if we are um, fearful, we're not inventive and constructive. So um, 
so for me, being able to tell positive stories of the future has been very important for myself and, and also as a message. And, um, and that's, it's a challenging time. It's hard to tell positive stories right now. There are, it's not just sustainability challenges that the world faces at the moment. In fact, I think some of the challenges that we face, our social and political challenges are precisely because we don't have positive visions of, this, of the future. So, um, so anyways, that's, that's a lot on the theme of how um, sustainability relates to well-being, but they are, you know, in my mind, inextricably linked in that way. We need people to believe in the future in order to invest sufficiently in it and in order people to invest pro-socially in it. And yet they're also quite distinct in the sense that um, we will need to, we need to make some decisions without an eye to optimizing uh, some calculation of what's going to be best for humans. Um, and to uh, instead embrace something that I, again, have to just call conservation. Thank you so much, Chris. I think you, you know, we didn't, we didn't ask all the questions. There's a lot of questions in the box, but did you, you did touch on so many other elements of, of people's questions about, um, you know, inequality and uh, I would say, you know, disproportionate uh, populations and so forth. and. Um, I'm going to answer uh, one question about you know people always ask about you know race and um, disproportionate populations uh, and unfortunately there's no like at least from the Gallup data that we have is you know um, for different countries and it doesn't go specifically sometimes into race and um, or different uh, groups so if, like for the United States there there is I think there was the the I think the US daily poll would do that. And I don't know, Chris, do you know of any other surveys out there that ask surveys to different populations in the country? I know it's very a unique thing in the United States, but does Canada do that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I, there, there are, um, you know, there are no global surveys quite to rival uh, Gallup's World Poll in uh, life evaluations, but there are, there are a lot of data, uh, many different surveys, including you know, detailed panel data, panel surveys run by governments uh, and countless other, um, uh, countless other contexts in which people are asked life evaluations. And those surveys have a whole variety depending on their, their theme uh, of coverage. So there are places, uh, of course, where there, there, there are data within countries or regions where there are such data. Um, Canada is a good example. Um, we used to ask in Canada only about ethnicity, not race. Now I think um, you know, we ask both on major surveys. So there, there's plenty of research. I shouldn't say plenty. There is research on, on that kind of question. It's very important. Um, US is also a little unusual in, um, it, it actually doesn't have any domestic surveys uh, other than the daily poll. Um, with a full 11 point uh, life evaluation question. Anyway, that's a bit of a, it, it's technically odd in that in that sense. So we have to appeal to data from the World Value Survey, from the Gallup Daily, Daily Poll, which is domestic, and from the World Poll, if you want the full, um, full life evaluation scales. But that's hopefully going to change, um, you know, the, with, with the US government also getting in, uh, appropriately interested in, in these happiness measures. Anyway, good. Another good topic of, of research. There is work done on that, and uh, much more to do. Yeah, that's a, that's a very common question we get all the time. Um, you know, what about you know this population or, or that population? I'm I'm happy you touched on it. And there there is data out there, um, not specifically what we publish in the World Happiness Report. Um, we're almost out of time, um, and I would like to tell the audience that we'll do our very best to answer the questions that you put. I see some psychology questions. I, I see some other policy questions that um, the editors and of course, friends and experts of our uh, happiness uh, network can, can help answer. Um, maybe in about two minutes, Chris, maybe you can tell us about, you know, uh, work that you're working on now or work that you want to do in the future so we can uh, follow you and, and all the great research work that you do. Um, you know, I, I do feel the need because it's come up a, a couple of times just to mention that I, I focused on uh, economics, maybe even more so today than in the chapter. 
as an academic field. Um, and I give a reason for, for doing that, but, um, you know, there is, but, but in reality, uh, people working on happiness uh, uh, wonderfully and more so than many disciplines do cross disciplines. And so, um, uh, of course, there are a lot of psychologists and economists who work together and contribute to the same knowledge base, um, sometimes with slightly different language. Um, but also other fields in terms of you know the quantitative analysis. There, there are a lot of sociologists and 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 people from other disciplines. So um, for all of you, all the the psychologists out there um, with budding interest in this field, um, it's it's um, it's very rich and and promising thing to get into as well. Um, in terms of ongoing work, you know, I'm doing um, a lot of work actually related to policy frameworks and, and discourse at the moment. Um, and uh, so w w interesting, interestingly, because, you know, the kind of analysis that I presented in this chapter, honestly, is not um, the norm. I'm usually the kind of, uh, you know, doing the kind of statistical inference regression and so on um, that we've talked about is the science of well-being. Um, but, but I've become interested in the fact that there are a lot of different discourses, um, just even within a country like Canada, different groups of practitioners or, or academics speak slightly different language when they talk about well-being. And that's fine and great, um, but they do also need to understand what each other are, mean when they use the word, uh, say, well-being. And so we're holding some little dialogues um, for that kind of exchange. and. Um, and we're bringing people together from, from the policy and practitioner world to uh, think about what it means to, to have the kind of broad agenda that um, I mentioned earlier. Uh, what else? I'm also going to be starting up a, an online um, we a seminar series um, joint between uh, an economist, me at McGill, and a psychologist um, at University of Toronto, and that'll be in the autumn, uh, maybe once a month to start off with. And so that'll be a, um, a place, you know, maybe the first happiness uh, science online seminar on this side of the Atlantic for people to come and um, join in. That, that would be amazing. Um... There's a lot of information that was this dispensed at this webinar. Thank you again, Chris, for your contribution to the World Happiness Report and being available to answer some questions and, and discuss further your chapter and uh, the future of this. I want to remind everyone that you know these conversations don't stop here. Uh, we are going to try to continue having more conversations with the contributing um, authors of this year's report. But also, we don't want the conversation to stop here. Um, please feel to join us in our future webinars. Um, we'll post them either on Twitter or in the newsletter. Um, there is a symposium coming up at Oxford that deals with um, economy and happiness. Um, we have something in person in Italy this week, um, talking about the world happiness again in general. And um, we will have more webinars coming up. There will be a slide at the end that will show you some upcoming webinars and you know we will also post it on our newsletter and we hope you continue to follow us um, and continuing the conversation on well-being and happiness for our future. Thank you everyone. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and we hope to see you again. Thanks very much, Sharon. Thanks to everybody Thank for great questions.